Our final author this morning is best-selling author and is one of Oprah's favorites. So by United States law, he's also one of our favorites. Please welcome Mr. Wally Lamb. Thank you, Chelsea. So I'm rocking my uh, new uh, BEA threads here. Um, <laughs> hoping I've gotten all the tags out. Um, so I saw the new Star Trek movie a few days ago, and uh, it started me thinking about time travel, about how if we zoomed, say, 40 years into the future, Honey Boo Boo would be menopausal. <laughs> Justin Bieber might need Viagra. And Beyonce and Jay-Z would qualify for the senior citizen discount at Walmart. But as Kierkegaard once observed, one of the central ironies of human existence is that life can only be lived forward, but understood backward. And so with that in mind, I would like you to hop with me onto my time machine. I'm taking you back to 1966. LBJ is the president, and uh, Valley of the Dolls is writing the bestseller list. <laughs> I was a high school sophomore. My biology teacher, Mrs. Minky, had set up a genetics experiment in which we are to study heredity and characteristic through several generations of a single family of fruit flies. Now, the fruit fly is an ideal subject for such study because of its manic life cycle, Mrs. Minky said. <laughs> which is true, it's possible if you're a fruit fly to be born on Monday morning and play with your grandkids by Thursday afternoon. <laughs> We budding biologists are assigned tasks, and mine is to feed the flies. And so at the end of each school day, I climb the stairs to the biology lab, open the glass jars that hold our populations, drop into each piece a piece of rotten banana, and then screw the lids closed again. Now, sometimes after completing my task, I put my face to the jar and study for a few minutes the feasting and fornicating that will ensure the continuation of the species. Now, the genetic experiment proceeds on course until the fateful Friday afternoon when I climb the stairs, open the jars, drop in the banana, and then forget to replace the lids. By Monday, the entire four-story building is infested, and Mrs. Minky gives me a <laughs> bracing, finger-wagging speech on the subject of scientific responsibility, all the while batting at the fruit flies around her. Vroom, vroom. Now it's two years later, and despite my shortcomings in the life sciences, I find myself in a senior class titled Honors Physiology, taught by none other than Mrs. Minky's husband, <laughs> Mr. Minky. <laughs> by mid-year, my classmates and I have become so proficient with scalpels and frog innards that we're presented with dead cats, one plastic-bagged corpse for each future physiologist. These specimens are expensive. Mr. Minky tells us as he yanks one stiff feline after another out of a big plastic barrel and presents them to us like awards. These cats have cost the school a lot of money. Our having them, he said, was an honor. <laughs> I unsheath my body-bagged cat and stare down in fear and horror. In, in its fur is pungent with formaldehyde, its teeth and claws are bared, it has died, mouth open as if in mid-howl, kind of like this. <laughs> a study in sheer terror, in the instinct not to die, and it's mine for the rest of the semester. Now the following year, as a college freshman, I will sit in a darkened history class and watch silent black and white footage of blank-faced naked corpses being bulldozed by the Nazis into a communal pit. And that same semester across campus in a darkened appreciation, art, art appreciation classroom, I will get my first glimpse projected from a slide onto a screen of Edvard Munch's famously disturbing painting, The Scream. And from that day to this one, May 30th, 2013, I see that trio of images superimposed. The face of my dead cat stiff and supine before me on the lab table, the death masks of Hitler's victims, and the visage of the tortured soul in Munch's painting, who stands, hands slapped against his face, 
and screams in horror at, at what? Life? Death? The 20th century? The 21st? Now, Mr. Minky is a coffee drinker, and he's a man of misplaced faith. And so, as we are an honors class, he makes the assumption that we will act honorably whether he's in the room or not. And so it is his practice to leave us for long stretches of time with our dead cats and our worksheets <laughs> as he strolls down to the teacher's room while we engage in higher level scholarship. But we are not honorable. We're kids, irresponsible, and I see now in retrospect intimidated by all that rigor mortis around us, all those silent screams of death. And so in fear, we grope for comic relief. And it is I who proposes the idea of staging the mock wedding. <laughs> to my surprise, the concept catches on, and my peers and I abandon honor and scholarship and the feline circulatory and digestive systems, and we throw our energies into the surreal nuptials to come. On Friday, Mr. Minky leaves class on schedule at the beginning of the hour. With the coast clear, we dress our corpses in their makeshift tuxedos and gowns. Karen Barbarossa's cat is the bride. Jimmy Bradley's is the groom, and Connie Balecki has baked brownies for the reception. <laughs> I am the officiating man of God, Father Wally. Unwisely, I am performing the ceremony with my back to the door, when all around me, my classmates' eyes drop and their cats thunk back down against the lab tables. Mr. Minky has made an unscheduled visit, has crashed the wedding to pose this philosophical question. Who started this foolishness? <laughs> and so, with two scientific strikes against me and the blessings of both Mr. and Mrs. Minky, I abandon my future brilliant career in life science and become instead first an English teacher and later a fiction writer. <laughs> Still examining life, of course, but doing so without cadavers and sharp instruments. You know, life, we think about it, when you boil it down to its bare bones, reduce it to the lowest common denominator. What it comes down to, I think, is that we are governed by three basic instincts. The need to find food so that we won't starve. The need to satisfy our sex drive so that we won't become extinct. That, by the way, Chelsea, Chelsea is why we're supposed to be uh, you know, having sex. And then three, <laughs> the need to understand and interpret the world around us on some intellectual level to live deliberately, as Thoreau put it, while he gazed at the waters of Walden Pond. And it's that third impulse, our hungering to figure out the world, that distinguishes us from the lowly fruit fly and the instinct-driven cat. And so unlike these simpler life forms, we scratch our skulls that house our sizable brains, <laughs> and we think. We try to make order out of chaos because we hunger to understand the world and our place in it. And thinking, of course, leads to reading and writing, which is where you and I come in. You know, at times, understanding the world, making order out of that chaos, seems insurmountable. I mean, how could the Holocaust have happened? Why do hunger and homelessness persist in this land of plenty? How could that psychotic young man have entered Sandy Hook Elementary School and opened fire on five- and six-year-olds? And what did those brothers imagine they could accomplish by detonating pressure cooker bombs in the midst of innocent bystanders on that beautiful sunny day in Boston? Vroom, vroom. It's the 70s. I'm a college sophomore during turbulent and seductive times. Politics and cultural sea changes are inviting baby boomers like me to fight for social justice and party hardy. The sexual revolution has arrived, and marijuana perfumes the dorm. The Vietnam War and the civil rights battle intensify, and the soundtrack of these years segues from this is the dawning of the age of the Aquarius to by the time I got to Woodstock, we were half a million strong, to tin soldiers and Nixon coming, we're finally on our own. Prepare ourselves for the real world? Hey, shit, man, we were going to fix it. I'm on strike, I told my father over the phone after the invasion of Cambodia and the killings at Kent State. The hell you are, he shouts back into the receiver. You get to class. 
but my dad and Richard Nixon are more or less interchangeable that season. <laughs> and so I hang up the phone on the old geezer, and I stick my fist in the air, and I join the protest. Vroom, 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 vroom. It's 1972. I've graduated from college, but I have not launched myself into the chaotic world at large. I've taken a U-turn, returning to the high school from which I had graduated in order to teach English. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Minky. <laughs> Wally, please, we're colleagues now. It's Dorothy and Jimmy. Uh, okay. My first classes are the ones none of the other teachers want, comprised of students who have been retained so many times that some of them are my age, 21. The sweat hogs, they're fond of calling themselves. My plan is to win them over by releasing them from the prison that school has been until I had gotten there. I will open their minds by making their education relevant. Well, the sweat hogs and I honeymoon for about a week until the day I approach Seth Jinks. He's a surly senior, and I ask him to take his head off the desk and pay attention. Now, Seth works nights, and so he sleeps at school during the day. And he raises his head, as I have asked, opens his bloodshot eyes, and says, why don't you go, why don't you go, well, I know Doris and Ishmael would be cool if I said what Seth said, <laughs> but I don't want to offend Chelsea's more delicate <laughs> sensibilities. So let's just say that Seth suggests in a profane way that I engage myself in an activity more commonly than involves two people when they're naked. <laughs> the class and I hold our collective breath. The School of Education has not prepared me for this. And so I have no clue about how to respond. But then mercifully, Seth unfolds his long legs, stands, and ambles voluntarily out the door and up to the principal's office, thereby saving my teaching career. And so I remain at that school for the next 25 years. <laughs> now, about nine years into my tenure as a, at, the high, at the high school, without any premeditation, I sit down one day and I begin to write fiction. This is during the summer of 1981, the exact same month that Jared, the first of our three sons, is born. Jared, who, when he is a toddler, and I have just found out that my first short story will be published, I will pick up and toss into the air so exuberantly that his head will hit the kitchen ceiling. <laughs> but not to worry, our kitchen at the time has one of those drop ceilings <laughs> with the acoustic foam panel. So, Jared doesn't clunk his head, it just disappears for a couple of seconds, <laughs> and then it comes back into view. <coughs> Jared, who later, when he is a high school senior, I will overhear complaining about the old geezer. And I will look around to see if my father has come. <laughs> but no, he will mean me. You know, the great singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell once observed that the seasons go round and round, the painted ponies go up and down. We're captives on the carousel of time, which indeed we are. You know, parenthetically, in another of Joni's songs, she sang, woke up, it was a Chelsea morning, which it is. <laughs> but that's beside the point. BEA has invited me here today to tell you a little something about my forthcoming novel, We Are Water. It's a story that is set both here in New York and also, like several of my earlier novels, in Three Rivers, Connecticut. Now, the template for the fictional Three Rivers is my non-fictional hometown, Norwich, Connecticut. You know, when you mention that you come from the nutmeg state, state you're likely to conjure in people's minds images of Oh, leafy bedroom towns whose Tony residents commute to Manhattan and unwind at the country club and send their kids to prep school. But I come from the other Connecticut, east of the Connecticut River, Connecticut. We're more feisty than fashionable. We're more liverwurst than pate. Boston and Providence exert a greater pull on us than New York, and so we drop our eyes, root for the Red Sox, and use the word wicked as an adverb as in this example. We had a nor'easter last winter, and it snowed wicked hot, and it was wicked heavy to shovel. In writing We Are Water, I time-traveled back to my own childhood, 
focusing on two traumatic events that I remember vividly. The first was a death of a black man that was ruled accidental, but that might really have been murder. The second was a terrible flood that cut a path of destruction through the city and took five people's lives. I was eight years old when Ellis Ruley's frozen body was discovered at the bottom of his driveway, which was stained by a trail of blood that led back to his house. Ruley had been a laborer who, in, later in life, began inexplicably, inexplicably and incessantly to make art. He was unschooled. He knew little about perspective or techniques like chiaroscuro, but his paintings were alive with color and story. He couldn't sell his work in his lifetime, but today it is highly prized by collectors of American folk art. Now, two things about Ellis Ruley made him noticeable in the 1940s and 50s in Norwich, Connecticut. First, because he had been awarded a substantial insurance settlement due to an accident in which he'd been hurt, he had been able to afford a gleaming Buick convertible. And second, he was Norwich's first African-American resident who had married a white woman, a German immigrant named Wilhelmina. And when Ellis would drive through Norwich in his big car with his white wife beside him, he was construed by some as rubbing his good fortune in the town's face. Perhaps he should have been more leery because a few years earlier, a relative who lived on Ellis's property had been found drowned with his feet sticking out of a shallow well and the coroner had ruled that death accidental, too. Now, I was 12 in March of 1963 when an earthen dam holding back a lake at Norwich's north end gave way on a rainy night, unleashing millions of gallons of water and sending slabs of ice the size of refrigerators shooting downhill in the surge, carrying trees, cars, family pets, and human beings. The raging flood water came perilously close to our own house, and to this day I can still hear the thunderous roar, as well as the screams of third shift factory workers who were buried alive in the rubble of a collapsed yarn mill. Besides those factory workers, a young mother lost her life that night. She and her husband, both in their mid-twenties, made the fateful decision to try and outrun the water that they had been warned was headed their way. And so they loaded their three little boys, age four, age two, and 10 months, into their car, and they took off. But sadly, they couldn't outrun the flood water. It carried the car along with it and then pitched it off a 10-foot wall. The family went underwater but managed to get out of the car and onto the low roof of a storage shed at the back of a Ford dealership. The father climbed into a nearby tree the mother handed the three boys up to him, and then just before Margaret Mooney herself got up into the tree, the water carried her away and drowned her. Her husband has passed on now, but those three little boys have survived and thrived and are today in their early 50s. In the writing of my novel, I became their friend, and two summers ago, the four of us walked the flood path all the way from the now fortified dam to the tree from which they were rescued, the tree of life, Tom and Jimmy and Shaw and Moody nicknamed that tree, and indeed it was. So when I began writing We Are Water, I took those two actual, unrelated hometown events, Ellis Ruley's untimely death and the Norwich flood, and I set them apart from each other like poles electrodes, I guess. And in the space between them, a kind of electrical energy began to bounce and crackle and generate itself. An electrical arc, if you will, that over the next four years became the arc of my story. And so as fact became fiction, Ellis Ruley became the younger and more virile Josephus Jones, who dies at the hands of a bigoted white father who suspects that Ellis has had a clandestine sexual relationship with his daughter. And Margaret Moody became flood victim Maura O'Day, whose baby daughter perishes with her in the flood, and whose five-year-old daughter, Annie, grows up and becomes an unschooled outsider artist 
and one of the novel's two main characters. So before I close, let me do one last bit of time traveling. This time into the not too distant future. At the end of October of this year, We Are Water will become available in libraries and brick and mortar stores and electronically over the internet. And I want you to know how grateful I am to each and every one of you, the publishers and booksellers and librarians and writers and bloggers who will connect my book and Ishmael's and Doris's and Chelsea's to those who might wish to read them. I want you to think of it this way, that the writer and the reader are two poles mm -hmm. apart from each other. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are the electricity that connects us. Thank you. Thank you, Wally Lamb. Um, you're obviously sexually obsessed with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's pretty inappropriate to talk about those kinds of things this early in the morning. Um, this has been wonderful to hear for everybody. And again, I want to just reiterate how grateful all of us are, as different as each one of us is, how grateful we all are to have people like you who are able to put our product out into the open so we can reach and touch so many people no matter how we do it. 